Getting ready to buy or sell a home? Do you want to help support pro-life organizations? Then you need Real Estate for Life. Get a top-notch real estate agent and support pro-life causes. Go to realestateforlife.org to learn more. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Dear friends, what is the abomination of desolation? Who are the false prophets usurping Christ's authority and possibly leading astray even the elect? Why so many dreadful cataclysms to come? We are legitimately concerned about these evils to come. The horrors to come will be painful. There will be confusion and distress. Our Lord does not warn us without reason. He wants to give us time to be prepared. But how? How do we get ready for the end of the world? In this homily, I would like to offer some answer. I believe we must train in recognizing horror for what it is. But is it possible not to realize that something is horrible? Is it possible to become so accustomed to something very bad that we go along with it and even pretend that it is all right or even good? In such cases, we are truly following false prophets. What if such compromission and blindness were the most horrible horror? To call horror law, to call horror good, to call horror peace. Many just men before us had to choose between false city imposed by violence and the voice of conscience. Think of all our martyrs during the tyrannical persecution of Holy Church in England during the Protestant Reformation. Think of those who risked their lives rescuing Jews and other refugees in Nazi Germany and courageous opponents to the communist atrocities such as Alexander Solzhenitsyn sent to the Gulag more recently, think of the many Catholics dying at the hands of Muslim and even Hindu fanatics. Surely, we would call all such situations horror. And yet, the majority of men went along with it and still go along with it, often out of fear, but also out of personal interest. Is it possible that we find ourselves in a similar situation nowadays? If so, do we recognize it? In some hundreds of years, will men look back at our times and will they fail to understand how most of us complied with the horror, having lost the true perception of right and wrong? Let us take three examples. One, God said to sanctify his day, the Sabbath or Sunday. Sunday is the weekly thanksgiving for the resurrection of the Lord at Easter. Is there any greater event than God's victory over death, the consequence of sin, on our behalf after so much suffering on Calvary? But increasingly our western world works on that day trade is more important than worship trade is the new worship with supermarkets better kept than churches and much much busier and yet the hebrew people had been led out of egypt 
for no other purpose than to offer God's sacrifice. While they were slaves, they were unable to honor God truly. Freedom was ordered to religious duty to God. Sunday business and trade directly oppose the law of God given on Mount Sinai. More often than once, good Catholics come to me saying that their work contract or their manager prevent them from attending Holy Mass on Sunday. No divine worship for these poor people. They are like the Hebrew people led back into the slavery of Egypt. It is horror. But we have become accustomed to such horror. To atone, to please God, and to enable us to recognize the signs of the times predicted by our Lord, let us commit afresh to buy what we need the day before Sunday or the day after. Let us make better use of the worshipping opportunities offered us, such as Sunday Vespers and Benediction at 5 p.m. here at St. Mary's. And if you cannot come back in the afternoon, it is also broadcast on live mass at 5 p.m. And it goes without saying, let us make sure that we fulfill the church obligation to attend Holy Mass every Sunday and Holy Day of Obligation, neglecting to do so without a gravely proportionate excuse such as ill health or transport strike constitutes a grave sin which deprives us from habitual grace and forbids Holy Communion until we have been absolved in confession. Two, another example of horror we have got accustomed to, even worse than the first. Yesterday, in the street, I was asked by a man who described himself as a committed Christian believer if in our church we did gay marriages. He and I had a respectful conversation. He did not object when I pointed that when in Genesis God created Adam and Eve, God altogether united them in matrimony and assigned to them the splendid mission of procreating new human lives. Thus, divine wisdom ordered sexual activity essentially to procreation. Human biology would suffice to prove this for those who don't read the Bible. And yet, never in the history of mankind has procreation so shamelessly been separated from sexual intercourse. Homosexuality, by definition, rules out procreation, but contraception, contraceptive sterilization, and of course, abortion, gravely contradict the divine wisdom. We have grown accustomed to such horrors. Natural justice should suffice to rule it out, but for us Christians who believe that God took flesh from a virgin, how much more should we defend the sanctity of the womb, the very temple in which God on earth was first worshipped between the Annunciation and the Nativity? Is there worth abomination of desolation when surgical vacuuming enters that holy of holies and sucks away human lives at their most innocent and vulnerable stages. We must wake up to such horror before Christ returns. Let us ask ourselves what more we can do to help mothers not to give in 
such a delusion as abortion, for fathers not to give up their manly responsibility toward mother and child, for doctors, state, and media to push out the idol of selfish comfort and welcome back instead the divine gift of generous parenthood. Three, I am afraid there is even, even worse. This will be my third and last example of our blindness to contemporary horrors. If God is mocked when his Sabbath is ignored, if God is hurt when his gift of life is rejected, what when his very own body and blood are trampled upon? In the Holy Eucharist, Jesus Christ, true God and true man, is present truly, really, substantially with his body, blood, soul, and divinity. How many profess this truth and yet behave to the contrary? How many, even among Catholics, have grown accustomed to treating the Eucharistic God in the Blessed Sacrament as if that were not really God, but some lovely symbol for God? How many who will come and receive Holy Communion without having prepared their hearts and bodies through at least a short fast, or worse, who will dare to receive while in state of mortal sin? How many will wipe away from their palms small fragments of the sacred host, oblivious to the fact that each fragment is the very God who made heaven and earth out of nothing? How many among the laity, but even more tragically, among the clergy at every level have become complicit with such mistreatment of God in the sacrament of his love. What will we tell him when he comes back at the end of times? That the catechism was not clear? That we meant no harm? that no saints had showed us Eucharistic reverence? Let us, dear friends, commit afresh to a much, much deeper respect and love for God our Savior in the Blessed Sacrament. Let us book in our diary today, I mean today, the date for the next Corpus Christi procession across town Sunday, 11th of June next. This Christmas, let us buy and offer some good books on the Holy Eucharist to nourish our faith. Let us attend Holy Mass at least once on a weekday in addition to Sunday and make a special communion of reparation. I conclude Dear friends, the more we recognize those evils for what they are, daring to call them horrors as they truly are, the less we need fear the end of times. Christ is already here. Christ is already present amongst us. The more we recognize him now, the less we need fear him then. In fact, he is amongst us now so as to help us meet him then. How foolish it would be to focus on terrors to come and neglect horrors present. On the contrary, the more we tackle present evils by God's grace, 
the less evil will threaten us in the end. As we enter the last week of the liturgical year, since next Sunday is the beginning of Advent, let us look back at the past year and examine how we have responded to Christ in our daily life. Let us resolve to do much and be better with his help for the new liturgical year. Let us beg him now to cast away from our hearts, from our souls, from our lives, from our world, the abomination of desolation. Let us commit afresh to a life of sanctification, empowered by the grace of God, poured upon us in his holy church. And may the Blessed Virgin Mary, full of grace, help us be freed from all idols to worship the only true God, her Son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.